This morning we heard a lot about the supply chain, and it was mainly from the developers. And now comes the real supply chain kind of uh, supply chain part of the discussion, and we will be very happy to feature a few OEMs in the session later. But before that, I'll introduce Richard Clarkson, who is the um, Asia-Pacific Technical Advisory Lead of ERM, who will give us a set the same presentation on the supply chain discussion. Richard, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Unaccustomed as I am to public speaking. Um, thank you, Li Ming. Um, I'm delighted to be here today representing ERM, uh, firstly as a, a sponsor for this event. Um, we do have um, 15 minutes uh, for this presentation, so I'll be fairly quick running through um, the slides. But over the course of the next 15 minutes, um, I'll be addressing how lessons learned and collaboration in Northern Europe helped to shape the offshore wind industry there and how these factors can help the APAC region. Um, just a quick introduction about ERM. Uh, for those of you who don't ERM, uh, know ERM, um, we are a global sustainability consultancy um, and we've been working in sustainability for over 50 years since 1971. Uh, rather than dwell on this slide, if anybody wants to learn more about ERM, um, we do have a booth in the main hall and we've got a, a, a fairly large team available who would be more than uh, willing to talk to you and, and bring you up to date on, on our specialities. Um, as Li Ming mentioned, um, I'm the APAC Technical Advisory Lead um, for ERM. Um, I've been based in Sydney now for three months, having spent the last two and a half years in uh, Vietnam um, as project director for a group of investors on a nearshore wind farm in Chavin province. Um, I've got 20 years experience in both onshore and offshore wind. Um, the top photograph um, is doing a, a blade bearing exchange at Arklo Wind Farm in Ireland. Um, I was there in 2003 when the wind farm was built as project manager. And then very, uh, the bottom photograph is uh, a snapshot from Hip Tang uh, in Vietnam. So the agenda really through this uh, presentation is to try and uh, bring some examples and best practices um, on the North Sea collaboration. Um, some of the supply chain challenges that I see in APAC, based on my experience, and then looking at um, the ports infrastructure in the UK and Europe, uh, and basically what can we learn from there and what probably needs to be done in APAC. Just to give you a quick um, history of the start of offshore wind in Europe, um, the first offshore wind farm in the world, uh, Vindeby, was built in Denmark uh, back in 1991. Um, I'm not sure if some of us in this audience were around at that time uh, in the market. I'm sure there are. Um, and then in 2000, um, Blythe Offshore Wind Farm was the um, first UK offshore wind farm to be built um, in 2000. Um, and that's off the Northumberland coast, which is the northeast um, of, of UK. And that was uh, two, uh, two, two megawatt Vestas turbines um, uh, in about 10 metres of water, less than 2K offshore. And then in that same year, uh, the first applications for the round one projects uh, for seabed leases were presented to the Crown Estate, um, who are the landlord um, for the seabed in, within UK waters. So let's move on uh, to look at some examples um, of best practice uh, and, and on collaboration in the offshore wind um, sector in the North Sea. So in June 2016, um, 
10, Europe ten European countries signed a memorandum of understanding for regional cooperation in the North Sea to further de the deployment of offshore wind energy. Moving forward three years into March of 2019, Orsted and Northumbrian Water Group, uh, a utility, UK utility company, um, signed the, the UK's first offshore wind energy PPA to deliver 100 gigawatt hours every year for the next 10 years. Later that year in December, um, a survey was done and wind energy represented 300,000 jobs in, the UK, in Europe. 75% of that number uh, were onshore and 25% uh, in offshore wind. And then in January 21, uh, the Danish government announced um, it would build the first energy island in the North Sea. The Danish North Sea energy island uh, would, emerge, would merge up to 10 gigawatts of onshore wind farms and will combine transmission, storage and power to X technologies to transport the energy to countries where the demand is highest. Wind Europe, uh, in conjunction with Hitachi, Ener Hitachi Energy, produced a report in uh, 2023 entitled Offshore Grids, The Next Frontier. And the, um, the figure that you can see, the, 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 the drawing on the, 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 sorry, the picture on the screen um, really shows you how uh, offshore wind farms in North Sea and in the Baltic could potentially be joint, uh, joined up and deliver electricity across the complete region. Some more examples of um, North, sea, North Sea or Northern Europe collaboration. Um, in 2021, ACOM was commissioned by the Crown Estate in, in partnership with the National Grid Electricity Transmission, the National Grid Electricity System Operator and the Marine Management Organization to consider the spatial context, in particular the constraints and opportunities which could influence the way in which offshore wind farms would, could connect to the electricity transmission system along the east coast of England in the future. The marine data exchange, by the way, is part of the, uh, the Crown Estate. Uh, sea Energy 2020, um, that was uh, put together with the um, European Technology Platform on Wind Energy, it was established to provide wind community representation communication, coordination and collaboration to national and European policymakers on research and innovation and wind energy. And you'll notice some words in there that are running common through this presentation and Fung's uh, presentation with regards to coordination, cooperation and collaboration. And then the Renewable UK uh, produced a report, um, the Industry Roadmap 2040, building UK port infrastructure to unblock the floating wind opportunity, which was sponsored by Renewable UK, Scottish Renewables, the Crown Estate again, in both UK, in England and in Scotland. Again, it's getting people, the right people around the table uh, to talk these issues through and to come up with uh, solutions to those problems. Leading on to the supply chain challenges that I see in, uh, in APAC. The lengthy per permitting process that we're seeing, uh, it can take up to 10 years from the site exclusivity, exclusivity agreement to the fully operational stage. Planning and obtaining consent approval takes four to five years on average. We need to learn the lessons that 20 years of experience in Northern Europe can bring to the table and, and hopefully um, speed up the permitting process and make it simpler for the developers to um, get these projects off the ground. Supply chain, 
you'll, you, you've heard a lot uh, throughout the day on supply chain, but essentially um, what we're seeing is um, uh, developers are in a rush to secure the most capacity in auctions, but the supply chain companies are struggling to keep up with the increasing demand with lower profit margins being seen due to high uh, pricing on raw materials. As Fung mentioned in his um, uh, presentation, there's simply not enough capacity in the supply chain at the moment and workforce, and I'll come to that shortly, to manage the number of bids and contracts. Raw materials, pricing increasing, um, interest rate hikes increase the cost of debt. Um, offshore wind remains competitive, but increasing capital costs will undermine the net zero goals. And last but not least, grid upgrades. Um, I've seen this in Vietnam, um, where the grid network cannot cope with the amount of renewable energy that's due to come onto the, uh, onto the system. And likewise, um, we'll probably see uh, similar issues maybe on, the, on, on such a larger scale, but certainly we'll see, see, see issues in Australia, the Philippines, um, on having the, having the need to improve grid capacity uh, at the right point of entry for um, the uh, offshore developments that we are looking at. I mentioned about people. Um, back in 2021, um, GWEC and the Global Wind uh, Organization, uh, in partnership with my old company, the Renewables uh, Consulting Group, who are now part of the ERM group of companies, did a, um, a study into um, the training needs um, and the numbers of people that would be required over the next five years, and this is from 2021, um, to meet the global uh, wind market uh, demand in line with uh, world best um, health and safety standards. And the figure there that are on the screen, training of, up to, of upwards of 480,000 people to meet um, the, the demand. The analysis um, in this study finds that we will need at least 280,000 more trained workers to install the forecast of 490 gigawatts of new wind power capacity coming online over the next five years. We have an opportunity in APAC to start that process now. With the closure of um, the coal mines, uh, here in Australia, or the, the, uh, and the oil and gas business, um, we saw the utilisation of more and more people with oil and gas experience in Europe um, and adopting some of the standards from the oil and gas business for offshore working. And all of that needs to be brought together. If every single project takes off on schedule, there still won't be enough people unless you start acting now. I actually put this slide in last night. Um, I subscribe to Tradewinds, which is a global shipping uh, industry news source, and lo and behold, I came across an article that uh, Fung uh, gave um, to the author, Jonathan Munzaya. And um, it was really talking about the, uh, the Asia-Pacific uh, wind farm pipeline being th threatened by the dearth of vessels. And again, this is a, similar, a familiar topic from, from this conference. Um, but there were two points that uh, Fung made that resonated with me. And he said, uh, the first statement was, um, the best option to build up vessel capacity in APAC would be for the market players in the region to cooperate on building up a regional fleet that will allow them to share spare capacity. 
Absolutely. 100% agreement in that. The second statement, unfortunately there is not much collaboration in Asia-Pacific. This is partly because of cabotage restrictions and local content requirements. Everyone ends up building everything themselves. You can do that. It can be done. Just conscious on time. So on the, uh, I just ran a report on the ERM's GRIP database looking at ports in the UK. And of the, and I apologise for the, the small print on the, on the spreadsheet, but I just wanted to give you an idea of um, what the report um, churned out. Essentially, there are 39 ports in the UK considered uh, usable for the offshore wind market. Of that 39, 19 are in operation. Um, there are six ports expanding operations, and there are 14 of those uh, 39 currently under development or being considered um, for redevelopment. And the uses of the ports range from fabrication, manufacturing, marshalling assembly, and operations and maintenance. And the other interesting thing on this was there are six European ports still being used for UK offshore projects. Cuxhaven, Eimshaven in Germany, Esbjerg, Denmark, Eimaude, uh, in and Flissinger in uh, the Netherlands, and Ostend in Belgium. To give you an idea of scale, this is Esbjerg port. That is what 100 offshore wind turbines look like, ready to be shipped offshore. I've run out of time, so I'm going to skip through these next couple of slides. Um, so to summarise, uh, in, again, personal opinion, local and state government, in conjunction with the port authorities, need to invest in redevelopment programme for the upgrading of port facilities to accommodate the large-scale offshore wind farms. Planning and reservations for construction vessels need to start sooner rather than later. Investment in building new construction vessels needs to start now. Recruitment and training of offshore works personnel needs to start now. And discussions with OEMs for local assembly establishments for wind turbines, towers, blades, foundations needs to start now. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I want to invite all the panelists down to the stage. Morten Dierholm, well Glob Global Senior v v Vice President of Marcom Sustainability and Public Affairs of Vestas. Peter Broom, Global Segment Leader Offshore Wind of DMV. Neil Steinberg, Chairman and Managing Director of Siemens Energy Offshore Wind Asia Pacific. Benoit Lavino, Global Head of Procurement Representative, Corio Generation. Thanks to everybody. And first, I'll give everybody a quick two minutes to introduce yourself and focusing on your experience in offshore wind and Asia Pacific. I'll start with Morten. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Represent Vestas, been with the company for 16 years, had uh, four of those uh, here in Asia, and uh, looking forward to uh, stimulating the debate on offshore here in Asia. News. Yeah, hello, my name is Neil Steenberg. Uh, I work for Siemens Gamesa uh, in Taiwan, where I've been the last uh, almost seven years, uh, helping the first uh, country in Asia outside of uh, China to get an offshore wind industry up and going, and certainly we have learned a lot as an industry there. Peter? Yes, uh, Peter Brun. I'm the Global Offshore Wind Segment Lead in DNV. I joined the wind industry back in 2006 and had quite a lot of dealings uh, with getting onshore wind into the Asia-Pacific area at that time. In 2017, uh, I joined DNV and have been in this offshore segment role uh, ever since. And Benoit. 
Hi, Benoît Lavinal, Global Head of Procurement for Corio, uh, starting offshore in 2003, actually with uh, Richard back then. Uh, Corio is a global developer of offshore project with a pipeline of around 30 gigawatt, and half of that is in the APAC region. Uh, so we're, we're very focused on this region and looking forward to contribute to this discussion. That's great, because this morning we've heard a lot of discussions around supply chain, around the permitting issue. And especially on the, on the supply chain, it's mainly the developer that contributing their, their, their different ideas, and we're missing the, the OEM side of the story. And this is how this session is really completing that, that, that puzzle, completing that side of the story. And with such a diverse panelists, really, that we can really bring things out. I, I would like to first focus on the theme of the year for this year's summit, which is on collaboration. This is a very big topic. I think everybody has their own understanding of collaboration. Are we talking about cross-country collaborations, like Richard showed the case of North Sea? Are we talking about industry collaborations? Are we talking about which type of collaborations? Maybe I'll give every one of you one minute of your thinking of collaboration in today's summit. After hearing all this, what, what are the collaborations that we want to see in APAC? Starting with Benoit, maybe, this time. Sure. Um, one example I think I would mention is, is what we're trying to foster, especially when looking at, at creating more local capabilities in your countries, the looking to enter into offshore wind, is the collaboration between the, the kind of global suppliers, like the ones that, that we have on this panel, and the local players that are looking to learn and, and expedite their, their, their learning curve and their growth. And I think by bringing those two together, I mean, the OEMs do that themselves, but sometimes as well, there's many other opportunities to bring more of that quicker to help make sure that we, we build growth in a sustainable and, and safe way as well. Peter? Yes, so in DNV, uh, we really advocate that the industry are focusing on developing common standards, uh, international standard that is. It has been also underlined uh, during uh, other panels this morning. Uh, it's super important for achieving uh, scale economics in the industry and bringing down the cost of energy. Um, we have a vehicle for stimulating standard development. It's called Joint Industry Products. Um, we are inviting in most interested, mostly leading parties, into co-financing a discussion on recommended practice and developing uh, also standards from, from time to time in that vehicle. It's uh, super efficient. And um, we, in the offshore wind space, have actually a number of outstanding joint industry projects at the moment, focusing also on floating wind, but also on hurricane and earthquake risk in the region. And if you don't know about this vehicle, I really encourage you to check it out, because it is super for collaboration among industry parties in competition with each other but agreeing on the point that we need to come together and agree common standards. Great, thanks. And uh, news? Yeah, of course, what, what I would like to focus on is, is uh, in order for Asia Pacific to stay relevant in, uh, in the offshore wind industry, of course, Asia is facing a tremendous competition for resources, uh, mainly from Europe, but certainly also from the US. I think it's extremely important that the governments learn to, uh, to collaborate and also to realize that uh, we cannot build a supply chain in every country who wants an offshore wind turbine. Uh, more specifically, uh, governments like to look at the wind turbine and say, can you please make that in my country? Uh, and unfortunately, that is simply not possible anymore. There is not the volumes, uh, there is not the, the stable outlook that we need, uh, and frankly, we don't need a turbine factory in every country in the world. So from our side, collaboration between governments, realizing some countries are maybe good at foundations, some countries could be good at something else, uh, but no country is equally good in everything, and also cannot have it, the whole supply chain. It simply doesn't work. Thanks. And Morten. Yeah, I, I, I think it's safe to say, uh, after listening to a lot of the country uh, delegations and also touring around the Asia Pacific area here the last 10 days, we're going to be fairly busy, you and I, and on uh, building factories everywhere uh, if all these plants are, are to stack up. 
Um, but that's, as you say, it, it's simply not feasible. Um, I mean, I, I think I can speak on behalf of both of us. I mean, let's take a generic factory. Uh, in order for that to have any economic feasible way forward, it has to have a constant production of at least a gigawatt of components every year for many, many years, right? Um, and you have in the region in total enough permanent projects to keep a stability in an investment like that. And as also, as you say, uh, with an, an enormous global competition for investments. Uh, and the region has to find out uh, how to attract investments to the scale of, let's say, the IRA in the US, where you have a very direct production tax credit that fuels uh, supply, but at the same time stimulates demand on a quite a significant scale. And the same with EU that are now open for state aid. I mean, it, this is a global competition, and the region has to collaborate amongst themselves, but also with us in the private sector, to find viable business cases for these investments. Yeah. Thanks very much. I think this, all this points from different aspects of collaboration, the industry itself collaborating with the local players, the industry to industry kind of collaboration platforms, joint platforms, and also the fact that we're seeing now with every nation in Asia having that nationalism kind of like ment mentality that we want to do it all, it's not happening. It's, it's not really working, and that will really make us actually lose in this global race. And that's the challenge, and that's the key message that we, the industry as a whole, is trying to send to the governments around, around the APAC that this needs to be listened by the governments. And really, we need to check on the, all those local content requirements, the cabotage thing that we just mentioned by Richard just now, which is preventing us from forming a very useful supply chain collaborations. Then let's look more into the, the supply chain and the supply chain related collaborations. We've already seen lots of like things happened in the region, like taking Taiwan for example. Taiwan has the local content requirement, which is, which is by far the most strict and most prescriptive one in the whole APAC region or maybe in the globe. Do you, yeah, shall we comment a little bit on this? I'll start with news. Yeah, I think uh, we, we are going through a very interesting time in Taiwan. Uh, we are seeing tremendous challenges for the projects to, uh, to reach financial close, uh, so to get built. Uh, and that is, of course, partly a function of uh, the general inflation that we've had. So cost of everything has gone up in offshore wind, but it's certainly also an extremely strict uh, implementation of local content requirement uh, and very little flexibility uh, from uh, the authorities to to bend on these things uh, and I think the, I think the, the biggest challenge that we have with local content is that it kills competition uh, a country like Taiwan we have one supplier of castings we have one supplier of resin we have one supplier of you know everything you can think of we have one supplier. Uh, and that is exactly the opposite of what has made offshore wind successful. The reason why this industry is successful is because we, have, we compete. Uh, local content kills competition and it increases cost, unfortunately. Yeah, that's exactly the point. I think a few days ago when we were chatting, Benoit, you also raised the same thing, that if this industry is, protect, is being protected, by these local content rules, then it locks its competitiveness in the, in the global market. I mean, first we, we need to remember that there's many reasons to do local content without having a restriction on it, right? Local content could mean, you know, less uh, transportation needs, means more jobs locally. There's all kinds of good reasons for EMs and developers to consider it in the first place, even without having strict rules above it. But as you said, if you have too strict rules, it prevents developers to, to, to look for innovative solutions, to, to walk and, and find new solutions to similar problems with the, the OEMs, and also forces some of the local suppliers to go through a, a learning curve that is far too expedited, in a sense, and potentially brings problems later on. So, so I think, actually, you know, finding the right balance is critical in order to, to not 
to, to bring eventually a sustainable supply chain that is not there for the short term and not staying there. I think the, the, the ambition of the industry, I guess, is to build a sustainable supply chain that can be there for many years to come. Yeah, thanks for that. I think we, we touched on Taiwan. Oh, Peter. Yes, I, I just want to, uh, to insert that uh, one can also look at long, local content in a more positive way. And if the market is planned in, in a way where it is stable, it has scale, um, there's certainty about uh, the business case, yes, then you will actually attract uh, local supply chain into the market. The good thing about offshore wind is that there is a lot of natural local content uh, for offshore wind because there's a lot of the things in supply chain that needs to happen locally. Um, yes, there are also components that may come from outside. Um, and if regulators are forcing them into their market, yes, it will always have a price consequence. But I think personally that there's a little too much focus from governments that they need to restrict local content into a rigid concept instead of looking at it as a dynamic concept. And they are very much in the driver's seat also to actually uh, make it possible for the local supply chain to grow. Yeah, I think we're touching that point on how do we define local, localization? How do we define local contents? And I think localization actually can naturally happen as the developers you will source whatever that is the cheapest. And usually, if that makes sense, that will be sourced locally. So localization can naturally happen if it makes sense. So can you all share a little bit of your natural localization process that, that is already happening? That, that should anyway happen without being forced, the industry being forced into that compulsory localization process? Yeah, I mean, ports is one obvious example. I mean, uh, of course, every time we go into to new markets, we start looking about some of the ports capabilities, uh, you know, services and, and, and uh, the services that will be there to, to do some of these initial consulting areas and things like that, that you need to, to study your site. So I think that there's lots of examples across the, the value chain. And sometimes we're too focused on, on indeed the big, shiny NASA factory, but, but there's hundreds of possibilities of local services that can be developed across the value chain. Yeah, I mean, and the best industrial policy you can have is uh, ensuring you have enough permitted projects, right? I mean, it's as simple as that. Uh, because especially in the offshore side, I mean, we, we have an interest in being as close to projects as possible. I mean, it's in the, it's in the DNA of the, of the offshore industry. Um, and if you can see a stable enough pipeline or a stable enough time, uh, localization will follow in some form or the other. And the other one uh, is an elegant way of creating industrial policy, like in the US, where you get a top on uh, in terms of a tax credit. I mean, it's a very good way of stimulating supply. Uh, but the beauty of the US way is that they stimulate demand at the same time, where you can say where Europe is now trying to stimulate supply through state aid, the lack of permanent projects is not going to help Europe a lot, right? Because if there's no demand, why stimulate supply? So if you can get those two things right, I mean, you can do a whole lot in terms of industrializing and, and getting your supply chains. Yeah, yeah and, and just building on Benoit's uh, remark that, yes, there are certain things in the supply chain that needs to be localized. Um, and and I, I believe that another good strategy for a new market is also consider what would be that uh, open spot in the global value chain they could actually seek to fill, because then it would go beyond that national market and actually could be uh, a, an opportunity to supply the whole region. And that, again, seen from, from, from a scaling and, and a business supply chain planning perspective, that may actually be a more sustainable way and not only being dependent on the bumper circle in one market. Yeah, thanks for that. I think we've talked a lot about localization, but a very practical question. Um, go back to what the point that uh, Niels mentioned, that can we just, like every country in the APAC or in the, in the world, accept the fact that you'd only do the part that you are good at? How do we really persuade them to accept this? Or we should just give up and let, uh, let the reality teach them? 
what should we actually do? Should we stick to that teaching or should we let the reality do the work? <laughs> or That's a hard one. <laughs> if, if there is no answer, that's totally understandable. I think we should, I mean, continuously uh, have an open discussion with regulators and government about this. Um, sometimes it's a tricky point because one in, in the supply chain does not necessarily want to, to bring the best message that this is, you know, bad policy. So there is the, the exposure risk of, you know, bringing the bad message. But I think this is super important that the whole industry, you know, stay aligned on this and communicate. Um, yeah, so I think we need to talk about it. Put the fish on the, on the table, really. Keep the pressure up. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think just want to share that um, today uh, at the lunch break, we actually had the Global Offshore Wind Alliance Roundtable, which is a closed door roundtable, that we are bringing these messages into that set setting. That is a set up uh, with the government, the industry, and so we, at least, we are trying to push the message, but let's all try. It's, it's not easy. And just to, to, I mean, to, to give a positive message on that, there is immense ambition capabilities in those countries that we should also foster if we want to meet those ambitions targets. Yes. So, yes. so I think, you know, when you meet suppliers in Korea or Vietnam that have, you know, amazing ambitions, I think my first reaction is to listen and see what they want to do be yeah. before it, I tell them what they cannot do, right? Or I mean, go back to that question about volume, the visibility, the pipeline. If we have that, then supply chain will, will be solved just automatically. Let, let's move to another question. We've spent enough time on localization, on that whole nationalism, the protection kind of discussion. Let's move to the other side of the supply chain discussion, which is this whole supply chain crunch. We are indeed in a supply chain crunch. That what Feng just showed us is that by mid of this decade, we're not having enough supply chain capacity. That being the key components, the raw material, the turbine itself, every sex segment, the vessels, everything, the ports, the grid, everything. How do you view that? Do you view that, number one, we can solve it because we now already, 2023, start to realize that we have enough time because picking up the supply chain is possible in the next few years. Or we're already very late. What, what is your view on this? Which, which, which side do you, do you think is the answer to that? I'll probably repeat a bit the message that was mentioned before. First, there's a question about this perceived gap between supply and demand, about how many of these kind of tens and tens of gigawatts will raise the on the sea due to grid and permit being realized. But on the other side, what we spend a lot of time in, in, in Koyu is really helping to create capacity, right? And create capacity means finding new suppliers in new markets, helping them to actually you know, go through and create volumes. How fast can we be? In, in finding those solutions? I mean, I think every category of products being, you know, turbines, vessels, cables, will have different forms of solution. I think some of them can ramp up relatively quickly. Uh, some of them will be more difficult. Uh, but in general, I think there are solutions out there, but probably not to the tune of the hundreds of gigawatt that we're talking about, right? Maybe there's a dose of realism to be heard as well. Yeah, it, it, it always feels a little bit strange to sit and talk about. I mean, I'm often in debates where we talk about, you know, supply chain constraints and we can't get enough people. And it, it, it all seems like this very difficult, you know, a steep hill we have to climb. But it, it's it's the same time a little bit of an absurd debate because we are in a situation where we're looking for the projects. <laughs> uh, and, and we would wish there were more projects so we could actually supply for. We, at the moment, we are not in that situation, right? So it's a little bit, let's try and fix the, f the problems we have now, that there are not enough permitted projects to go around. Uh, and, and then we can talk about missing components or missing key raw materials or people or hands or whatever. Uh, and, th and then I would say, of course, if you then look at the forecast and all right, um, if we believe half of the government plans that have been announced over the last couple of years, which is in the thousands of gigawatts, they come through, yeah, okay, maybe then we'll have some problems, right? Uh, but again, to say to that, we've been there before. We've had crunches before, and we've had issues before when we've seen these 
big optics, and then we solve them. Because the minute we get investment signals that we can rely on, we will invest. I mean, it is as simple as that, but right now I don't see it really. I, th I think we should not lose sight that what we're dealing with here is also establishing critical infrastructure in uh, new markets. Uh, and surely, yes, uh, offshore wind has uh, become more expensive over the last year uh, due to the cost of inflation. Um, and here, again, I think there's a need also at the regulatory level, I mean, to understand these dynamics, which are many at the moment, because at the end of the day, they also need to guarantee to their populations that the lights are on when a coal plant is being decommissioned. Um, and therefore, also on their side, there needs to be um, yeah, a close eye on these developments to see can these projects actually be executed. Uh, we see actually examples in different markets that projects are delayed, some even cancelled, and developer is actually taking the opportunity to, to go out of the project and pay a fine. Uh, but of course, seen from a regu regulatory point of view and offtake point of view, that is no good. First and foremost, it's a delay, significant delay of a given project. Secondly, you will not have those green electrons that are so needed uh, for the transition. And I sometimes feel that I would like a little more um, yeah, understanding that what we're dealing with here is serious business. It is critical infrastructure that we need to get online at a certain day in, in the future uh, and, and actually have to look what it does take also with these dynamics we are playing with these days. Yeah, I can, I can echo what, what Morten says, is what, what we need is certainty uh, from the supply chain. Uh, and to be very frank with Asia, we haven't been the most dependable in terms of delivering what, uh, what we thought we would deliver. Uh, I, I, can in, I can mention Japan, I can mention Korea, I can probably mention round three in Taiwan. Uh, so we are not the most dependable region. I, I would say, though, that, that one thing which, which Taiwan really got right, they, there was many things I'm not agreeing with, one thing they did get right is that they simply allotted five gigawatts over five years in one go together with a, f with a tariff that enabled those projects to get built. And I, I'm looking at Australia here for doing something similar. If you go in off your wind, you don't go project by project. You give us a pipeline, a pipeline with a sustainable tariff, and we can build the project. But if it's just piecemeal, 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 one gigawatt at a time, I think you will find it's very difficult to attract the interest of the industry. Because to be frank, we have plenty to do in Europe already. Yeah, if, if I can add on that point, Nils, I fully agree. I think we have been talking today about I mean, some less good development in Taiwan and local content requirements, but what we need to recognize is actually that the regulator in Taiwan uh, did take an international approach from the start. They said this is going to be the best international standards. That opened up for uh, play, international play from developers and also equip equipment manufacturers, um, as you say. They had a long-term view on how they saw uh, the increase in the market. They also guaranteed uh, offtake grit, uh, which is a point back to, I think, what is going on here in Australia these days, that uh, you need to secure the offtake so there's no containment risk in that build-out of the Gippsland project. And fourthly, uh, they also designated harbor space, uh, so they made a screening on suitable harbors and actually said, well, we need space here uh, and, and did what needed to be done there. So yes, there's a lot of good learnings from, from Taiwan uh, and I'm quite surprised uh, what they have achieved in, in a very short while actually in terms of uh, delivery of new gear that there in offshore wind. Yeah, thanks. thanks for bringing Taiwan back on a positive note. We do see that as a very successful case in APEC, driving the offshore industry in such a short time, make it really happening in such a short period of time. That's, that's definitely a success. 
But to wrap up what you just said, what I've heard, I think the supply chain challenge is solvable or has a solution as long as we address those issues we mentioned in the morning. That is the route to market challenge. That is all these other challenges on inflation related which is tangled with the permitting being delayed, which gives the developers huge exposure to the inflation, to the other risks. If we can get all that sorted, together with the visibility, the pipeline, and that being strong pipeline, being enough visibility, then all these supply chain issues and challenges can be solved. That's really helpful for, for the panelists to share that view. We are almost running out of, of, out of time, so each of you, 40 seconds, to do a wrap-up of what you want to say to the audience today on the supply chain issue, on regional collaboration, anything that you can pick up. Start with Benoit. Sure. I mean, yeah, I think on, to end on, a, on a, a positive message indeed, I think this industry, the, the suppliers, the, 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 the experts, the developers have demonstrated back in Europe the ability to grow, to drive massive cost reduction in a safe and sustainable way. So, so I would back, you know, all of us to be able to do that in APAC as well, given the right sort of framework. And, and you know, in Australia, I think there's a great opportunity to do so. Yeah, I think uh, keep up the good momentum that you have created here with the feasibility around in Gippsland. Secure the off offset uh, risk uh, with the grid. Um, be uh, easy on how you handle local content requirements. Secure a uh, subsidy regime, a CFD, uh, which is important with the prices that we are seeing here. And um, yes, I mean, then create that path that can be built on to build supply chain also in Australia. So these are the points I would recommend from our side. Yeah, I mean, uh, we are in Australia. We are keeping our fingers crossed uh, that we get the, the industry to take off down here as well. Uh, I think we need to be realistic. It's not going to be cheap. Right? The, the first three, five gigawatts are going to be expensive to build. But once we get over that hurdle, I think offshore has shown consistently that it's a, it's a reliable and it's a dependable and in today's market, a cheap form of energy. But the first projects are not. And that we simply just need to realize and we need the offtake to support that. On that note, um, let's remember this industry has the best value proposition of any industry out there, right? We're solving the climate change challenge. We are delivering energy independence. We are creating lower electricity bills for consumers, and we also happen to create jobs and investments. You don't get that for free, right? There has to be value enough coming through these projects to sustain uh, the full value chain for the countries that invest in this. So let's not repeat what Europe is doing with a race to the bottom in the auction regimes. Make sure there's value enough for all of us, and let's get this going. Thanks very much. And I love those last positive notes on the fact that we possess all the value proposition that is needed in the today's energy market. And we are indeed the future. All these short-term challenges we're facing today on permitting, on supply chain, on lots of others, other challenges, I think it's all solvable. And as, as I mentioned this morning, that's what keeps us busy and give us that, that sense of responsibility so that in a few years time, when we look back, that we really have that sense of ownership that we created this. We created this history together and making that whole pathway, that energy transition happen as a reality. Thanks very much for the panel. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.